At Capella University, you'll get support from people who care about your success. From before you enroll to after you graduate, pursue your goals knowing help is available when you need it. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. Hey, so what's Top Golf? Well, it's golf, but it's also not golf. Not golf? Yeah, not golf, but still golf. And not golf. Yes. With the golf. Exactly. So you're saying it's golf. And not golf. Just to be clear, Top Golf is 100% golf. And also 100% not golf. But that's 200%. Right, but it's like a million percent fun, so can we stop doing math and just go play? It's golf. It's not golf. Hey! It's Top Golf. Download the app, book a bay, and come play around. This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 96, for broadcast on the 5th of December, 2018. Coming up on Space Time. Astronomers find a star almost identical to the Sun, watching the slow death of a nearby galaxy, and mysterious seismic waves shake the Earth. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered a nearby star which is almost a perfect match for our Sun, suggesting the two could be stellar siblings. Details of the star, named HD 186302, are reported in the journal Astronomy and Astrophysics. The study's lead author, Vedan Adabakian, from the Portuguese Institute of Astrophysics and Space Sciences, says since there isn't much information about the Sun's past, studying stars similar to the Sun will help astronomers better understand where in the galaxy and under what conditions our Sun was formed. The Sun wasn't born in isolation. 4.6 billion years ago, together with hundreds, maybe even thousands of stellar siblings, the Sun was formed during the collapse of molecular gas and dust cloud. There's good evidence to suggest that this molecular cloud collapsed under its own gravitational force after being hit by shock waves from a nearby supernova event, a classic case of life from death. As time went by, the stars in the solar cluster disbanded and scattered throughout the galaxy, making it very difficult to find them. To try and track down some of the Sun's siblings, the authors used data from the Coste d'Azur Observatory's Ombre Galactic Archaeology Project, together with data from the European Space Agency's Gaia mission and observations from the European Southern Observatory, giving them a sample of spectra from some 230,000 Sun-like stars. Their aim was to go through this data, looking for stars with the same chemical composition as the Sun. That same chemical composition would mean the star may have been formed in the same molecular gas and dust cloud as the Sun. Eventually, a single solar sibling was found, HD 186302, a star in the southern constellation of Parvo, only 184 light years away. As well as being the same age and composition as the Sun, HD 186302 is also a spectral type G3 yellow dwarf star, very similar to the Sun. If it really is one of the Sun's siblings, any planetary system around HD 186302 would also be a good place to search for life, as life originating on one planet orbiting a star in the Sun's stellar nursery could easily have been transferred to another planet through asteroid impact, the impact ejector being thrown into space and any life transferred via panspermia. Adipakian is cautiously excited about this possibility, saying there are some theoretical calculations showing that there's a non-negligible possibility that life spread from Earth to other planets or exoplanetary systems during a period known as the Late Heavy Bombardment some 3.9 billion years ago. He says if HD 186302 has a terrestrial planet in its habitable zone, it could well have been contaminated by seeds of life spread from Earth. That would mean an Earth 2.0 orbiting a Sun 2.0. And as you'd expect, the authors are now planning a search for exoplanetary candidates orbiting around HD 186302. This new solar sibling discovery is a far better match for the Sun than the previous nearest match, HD 162826. That was discovered back in 2014 and covered on Spacetime's predecessor program, Star Stuff. HD 162826 is a spectral type F yellow dwarf star, about 15% more massive, 500 Kelvin hotter, and about 100 million years younger than the Sun, with a 3% higher metallicity. 
The star's located in the constellation Hercules, about 110 light years away, and can be seen with a small backyard telescope near the star Vega. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. A new study shows that one of our nearest neighbouring galaxies, the Small Magellanic Cloud, is slowly dying. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Astronomy, show powerful outflows of hydrogen gas streaming from the satellite dwarf galaxy. These molecular gas and dust clouds are needed to maintain star formation. And without this supply, the galaxy is gradually losing its ability to form new stars. Astronomers made the discovery while examining the galaxy in the finest detail ever, using the CSIRO Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder Telescope, ASCAP, in outback Western Australia. The study's lead author, Professor Naomi McClure-Griffiths from the Australian National University, says the features of the radio images were more than three times finer than previous small Magellanic Cloud images, allowing the team to probe the interactions between the small galaxy and its environment with far greater accuracy. She says this constant outflow of hydrogen gas means the small Magellanic Cloud will eventually stop being able to form new stars and is doomed to gradually fade away into oblivion through a slow death. The discovery, which is part of a project that investigates the evolution of galaxies, has provided the first clear observational measurement of the amount of mass lost from a dwarf galaxy. The findings are also important because they provide a possible source of gas for the enormous Magellanic stream which encircles the Milky Way galaxy. McClure Griffith says ultimately the small Magellanic cloud is likely to eventually be gobbled up by our galaxy. CSIRO co-researcher Dr David McConnell says ASCAP is unrivaled in the world for this kind of research due to its unique radio receivers which give it a panoramic view of the sky. The telescope's capable of covering the entire small Magellanic cloud in a single shot, imaging its hydrogen gas with unprecedented detail. And that's important because hydrogen is, after all, the most abundant element in the universe and the main ingredient of stars. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Engineers in Melbourne have developed a 3D printed Aerospike rocket engine. The unique Aerospike design turns the traditional rocket engine shape inside out. The engine, produced by teams at Monash University, follows earlier research on developing the world's first 3D printed jet engine. That work led to Monash spin out company Amero winning contracts with major aerospace companies globally. As a follow on, Monash researchers have now developed the 3D printed Aerospike rocket engine also with Amero. The engine was developed, printed and test-fired in just four months. Monash engineers then created a new venture, Next Aero, to further develop the Aerospike technology. Amero engineer Martin Jerg says the Aerospike maintains great efficiency, but it's very hard to build using traditional technology. He says using additive manufacturing, that is 3D printing, allows the creation and testing of complex designs like the Aerospike. Ideas can be printed, tested, tweaked and then reprinted in several days, rather than taking several months using conventional manufacturing techniques. The team are able to focus on features that boost the engine's performance, including the nozzle geometry and the embedded cooling network. These are normally balanced against the need to consider how to manufacture such a complex piece of equipment. Jerk says it's not so with additive manufacturing. So we've used a process called additive manufacturing or 3D printing to manufacture a type of rocket engine that is traditionally very difficult to do, that we've been able to do this uh, entire project inside four months, uh, really speaking to what additive manufacturing and uh, some talented design engineers can do in a really short period of time. Now, 3D printing, we hear a lot about this with prototyping for all sorts of things from toys through to manufacturing tools that just placed a 3D printer on the International Space Station as well to help them up there. And even the idea of using 3D printing for rocket engines is starting to pardon the pun, take off. We, of course, have the Dragon 2 capsule from SpaceX. This will be the first manned capsule and it'll use 3D printed engines in its design. And in New Zealand, they've been developing a rocket called the Electron, which is also 3D printed. Tell me a little mm. bit about the engines that you guys are working on, the Aerospike. It's a different design completely, isn't it? That's right. So it's taking the uh, traditional bell-shaped nozzle and effectively turning it inside out. Traditional bell-shaped rocket engines work at peak efficiency at ground level. But as they climb, the flame spreads out, reducing thrust. That's because the bell needs to change shape as the launch vehicle increases in altitude in order to maintain peak thrust. 
The problem's usually solved by using a different shape bell known as a vacuum engine on a second upper stage. Next Aero project lead Graham Bell says that's where the Aerospark design comes into its own. With a traditional rocket engine, normally we can only see that bell nozzle at the bottom. We don't see the convergent and combustion chamber at the top, and these are normally wrapped in all sorts of complicated um, machinery like turbo pumps and, and hoses and control valves and all that sort of stuff. That's a traditional rocket engine. Traditional rocket engines are some ways quite simple in that they just have a particular geometry and sort of a, a nozzle shape to them. A drawback comes from using a traditional nozzle in that as a rocket ascends, as it travels through the atmosphere, going from sea level pressure all the way up to a vacuum in space, the outside atmospheric pressure is actually changing and it's going down. As we have the divergent section, so that, that expanding bell nozzle you see at the bottom of a traditional rocket, as we have that section, the gas is being expanded because the, the area is getting larger. And the idea is that you want that gas to be at exactly the right pressure as the same as the atmosphere. Now, obviously, with a conventional rocket motor, that is just this normal dull shape, it can only expand the gas all the way to one diameter. I mean, it's a fixed shape. And so that means that at some altitudes, the conventional bell nozzle is actually less efficient. And you can see on, if you quickly Google a picture of... Um, the Saturn V rocket, you can see some pretty dramatic examples of when it's taking up at sea level, the plume is nice and straight. But when it's at high altitude, you can actually see that it really expands out even much larger than the, the launch vehicle length itself. That expanding out process actually wastes a lot of thrust. And so the engine that we've designed is this special rocket nozzle design called uh, an Aerospike. Now, it's not the only engine design that can overcome this, this altitude problem, but it's one of them. The Aerospike engine is special that it doesn't have a divergent section. Instead, what we have is the, the divergent section is is now turned effectively inside out and pushed back inside the engine. And what ha what's happening here is basically you have a convergent section of a, of a rocket nozzle, that's still there. You have the throat, that's still there. But what happens is now is that spike extends out a little bit further past that throat section and the gas now pushes against one side on the, on the spike and the other side it's able to expand to the perfect diameter every time. So that means that the Aerospike rocket nozzle, the one that we've made, is an altitude compensating nozzle and it's most efficient uh, effectively all the way through its flight envelope in terms of pressure. And this saves on fuel? It's a complicated answer to give you the, the full technical brunt of it. It is approximately about 10% more efficient, and that's just from the design problem. So the conventional versus with a fixed geometry versus the aerospike with its sort of virtual changing geometry. So you get about 10% thrust increase just at those non-optimized pressures. You do unfortunately get some complications. So as you're flying through the atmosphere, not, you're not only battling the, the pressure change, but you're also battling the velocity change, the, the the change in how dense the air is as well, and all these sort of things all combine together and actually get this, this interesting wake structure behind the aerospike nozzle, which complicates that the answer of is it more thrust efficient, is it not? The, the general goal of this additively manufactured rocket engine is basically to, yeah, it's to show what we can do with, with the additive manufacturing process. It's to do these really complicated rocket designs. It's to show that we can use additive manufacturing in high pressure, high temperature environments. Tell me about the development side of it now. We looked at a, a number of different designs and the aerospike kept coming up. It's a slightly more efficient rocket engine. It basically, you get all of the, the complexity that comes with an aerospike rocket motor. Well, that's basically built into the additive manufacturing process process, all that complex geometry, all those complex shapes and material properties, they essentially come for free. From there, we develop the designs. We work in a team of six or so six design engineers and the, and the additive, additive manufacturing guys at Amero because we had such a short amount of time in there and part of the project goal was to show how quickly we would come up with new designs and actually make them. We had to work really quickly. So we worked with basically writing some design codes. So for example, how does the fuel system work? How does the uh, aerodynamics of the engine work? How does the stress analysis work? How does the core work, all these sort of things. We wrote a preliminary design, a, a concept design, and a, and a critical design. We, we wrote all these design codes. From there, we then wrote a larger framework, sort of like this toolbox that we could basically join all those codes together. And from that, we then had a rocket designing tool for this aerospike rocket motor. And that enabled us to basically iterate through all the different design changes, which you can imagine sort of are like a tree. They, you know, the complexity sort of just suddenly um, really ramps up very quickly. 
So with this tool, we're able to iterate on our design. From there, we then developed a, a CAD model and, and work with the active manufacturing guys. We were working on actually building a test rig, supplying the fuel, getting all the propellants necessary, all that sort of stuff. And then from there, we went into about maybe a month and a half of testing where we just worked our way up from small burns all the way up to the full power stuff. We're using um, methane, which is you know a particularly particularly popular fuel at the moment. I guess that comes from it's it's a very lightweight fuel for low molecular weight and that that increases your thrust coefficient which is kind of complicated to explain in a rocket engine but you want a low molecular weight fuel which methane is quite light only in only 16 and i think methane is also a pretty popular fuel in that it's quite a simple atom i mean it's, it's just carbon and hydrogen and, and that's something that i guess spacex and, and a few other those uh, sort of extraterrestrial companies are, are looking at making on mars and this is space time i'm Stuart gary Scientists say they're still trying to determine the cause of a mysterious seismic wave which shook planet Earth on Remembrance Day, November 11. The strange seismic event which rocked the entire planet was picked up by earthquake sensors across the globe. Researchers think it could be related to a series of seismic disturbances which have been rumbling in the Indian Ocean archipelago of Mayette over the past few months. A swarm of hundreds of small earthquakes and tremors have been detected originating about 50 kilometres off the Mayette East Coast since May the 10th. The largest on May the 15th measured a magnitude 5.8 on the open-ended Richter scale. The French-governed island archipelago is located about halfway between Africa and Madagascar and has a culture closely related to that of the neighbouring Comoros Islands. The ongoing small tremors have been a concern since May. But things got a lot worse on November the 11th when instead of the usual very low frequency, scientists detected a strange long flat vibration that seemed to hum without the usual fluctuation signature of normal quake activity. In other words, no primary or P waves and no secondary or S waves were detected. The mysterious wave repeated about every 17 seconds for about 20 minutes. Geologists are baffled they've never seen anything like this before. For the moment, their best guess is some sort of major volcanic activity, possibly linked to some sort of a huge magma movement under the Indian Ocean. While Mayet itself was created by volcanic activity, it's been dormant for over 4,000 years. Interestingly, the latest GPS readings indicate that since the earthquake swarm began in May, the island has moved approximately 60 millimetres to the east and 30 millimetres to the south, possibly due to the emptying of a nearby magma reservoir. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. Well, you may shudder to think of what you were like as a teen, but if you had a tidy room and were mature for your years, you may well be thankful today, according to a new study, which has found a link between teenage personality traits and the risk of death 50 years later. The study, reported in the Journal of Epidemiology and Community Health, found that teenagers who scored higher on personality tests for energy, empathy, calmness, tidiness, intellectual curiosity and maturity, and lower for impulsiveness, also had a lower risk of dying from any cause over the next 50 years. While this observational study can't establish cause and effect, researchers say it may be possible that personality can impact who takes up unhealthy behaviours. Archaeologists have discovered a rare tiny biblical stone weight inscribed in ancient Hebrew at a dig site at the foundations of Jerusalem's western wall. Only a handful of similar stone becker weights, as they're called, have so far been unearthed in Jerusalem. Scientists say the becker was a first temple period weight measure used by Jewish pilgrims contributing towards the maintenance costs of King Solomon's temple before ascending the Temple Mount. And some 2,500 years ago, the first coins bearing Hebrew script were inscribed with the word Becca. A new study has confirmed that in addition to erectile dysfunction and man boobs, guys who use androgenic anabolic steroids like testosterone also face a higher risk of early death and more hospital admissions. A report in the Journal of Internal Medicine compared 545 men who used steroids to 5,450 men who didn't. After just 7.4 years, steroid users were found to have a three times higher risk of death compared to non-steroid users. The prevalence of hospital visits, acne, man boobs and erectile dysfunction were also significantly higher. No wonder they suffer from roid rage. 
A new study has found that Twitter bots play an enormous role in spreading misinformation. A report in the journal Nature Communications, looking at the 2016 US presidential election campaign, examined 14 million messages and 400,000 articles shared on Twitter, finding that automated bots spread a third of the articles with the lowest credibility scores. They also found that bots were key to promoting low credibility stories just before they went viral. Researchers say slashing the number of software-controlled social bots could limit the spread of misinformation online. Deutsche Telekom has announced that its 5G network rollout is already over 80% ready, and it expects to have 99% coverage by 2025. 2019 is now also set to be the seminal year for the mobile telecommunications industry, with 5G smartphones set to reach the market. In fact, market watchers are now estimating that investment in 5G will reach $26 billion by 2022. Meanwhile, Telstra has announced that Ericsson will be its key 5G technology partner as the Australian 5G network expands beyond its current test phase. With the details, we're joined by Alex Sahar of Reut from IT Wire. Telstra and Ericsson have been partners for decades, so a long, long time. People like Nokia often work with you know, Optus and Vodafone. We also have Huawei, which has been banned from the 5G uh, network in Australia. That's l- long worked with Vodafone. But Ericsson has been one of the global uh, telco players for decades now, and Telstra has been its key partner in Australia. Now, there are supposedly 50 already 5G-enabled sites in Australia. I mean, already, I remember re- writing an article a year or two ago about how uh, Ericsson's 4G sites were able to be upgraded quite easily to 5G. You just have to pay I guess you had to pay Ericsson money so they would give you the new equipment. And the problem there was that the equipment was still being sort of ratified. It's meant to have been towards the end of 2018 that this standard was going to be ratified. Now, the problem is we won't see phones until really 2019 and 2020. And the 2020s are the real time when we're going to see widespread 5G rollouts. But Telstra has always been at the forefront. They were right off the mark, quick to bring 3G to market, quick to bring 4G to market, then quick to bring something called 4GX, which was a faster version of 4G. And, you know, Telstra's been doing a lot of testing of 5G at its innovation center on the Gold Coast, supported by Ericsson. And Ericsson's been working with telcos around the world to push this 5G standard forward. So, look, Australia is going to be at the forefront of 5G, but already you've got places in the US that supposedly have, you know, forms of 5G, and there's other parts in the world, in the Middle East and Europe and elsewhere, that are also doing a lot of work on 5G. So the 2020s will be all about 5G, and I guess by mid-2025, uh, we're going to start talking about 6G, and the whole thing will start again. And that report by Alex of royd from IT Wire. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. Crypto is like finance, but different. It doesn't care when you invest, trade, or save. Do it on weekends, or at 5 a.m., or on Christmas Day at 5 a.m. Crypto is finance for everyone, everywhere, all the time. Visit kraken.com slash see what crypto can be to learn more. Not investment advice. Crypto trading involves risk of loss. Cryptocurrency services are provided to U.S. and U.S. territory customers by Payward Ventures, Inc. View PVI's disclosures at kraken.com slash legal slash disclosures. Tonight in Arkansas, there's a mother tucking in her daughter and turning off the light. A business owner is burning the midnight oil. An at-home dinner date is plating up possibility. And it's all happening under one roof. How? The power of a conversation, like the one John from Integrity Solutions had with First Horizon Bank about his vision for a sustainable mixed-use building. Now it's not just words, it's life. 
First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash John. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC.